Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Michael, a.k.a. Rickshaw, and you are Nerding Out with Rickshaw. <laughs> Today, we have a very special episode. We have a guest, but let's go over to my co-host. Introduce yourself before we get going. I am Toby Von Doom. I am the producer, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Toby helps with all of the, uh, you know, the the effects going on in the stream right now. So, thank him for all of the cool neon lights. You know, it's like a, mu a music video. <laughs> here, so. But yeah, today we have a very special guest, uh, Will Swan. How are you doing, Will? I, um, doing pretty good. I I, w I was at Coachella all weekend. I'm in recovery mode today. You got a. You got a little hangover today, or are you feeling good? Uh, it, it's just more exhaustion. Yeah, I right. didn't really drink um, yesterday because uh, I wanted to get out of Indio like after the show and not deal with traffic today. Right, which was a good call. Like it was just a two-hour drive back to Los Angeles, like no traffic. And uh, today it's probably pretty hellish. I am like uh, against a lot of festivals honestly because you know like on paper you're like shit i would love to go to that but then when you're there you're like uh i'll have one beer that'll be twenty dollars and you're like oh shit <laughs> and then you're out in the sun like all day and you're like oh my god why am i so tired and you know all the things just add up to like geez dude i'm an adult i shouldn't be out here all day <laughs> yeah if you don't buy the twenty dollar beers you're, you're not gonna have much fun either so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that kind of helped so. you forget about the sun a little bit but uh yeah it was it was a good time i i, I kind of went as a um ex uh, just more for research like i i like going to festivals seeing you know maybe some different artists that i don't know and just uh seeing how different bands are doing production how they're connecting with their audiences um you know the kinds of connections people have with the music um this coachella i felt like it was pretty disconnected kind of you know it's just um a lot of the, oh it seems like a lot of the day most people were kind of socializing hanging out rather than watching artists and you'd go to like even the main stage or um, some of the bigger stages and there would hardly be anybody watching the groups playing and i was just like whoa what the hell um which is just a stark contrast from when I've gone in the past. Like my first catch all was 2004 and I felt like everyone had great audiences. It was like this big thing. And, um, the <clears throat> mystique of it seems to have died down quite a bit. My, my wife was like, you know, we, uh, we've been living in Austin since 2020. And like I said, you know, on paper, I'm like, you know, this seems cool, but I, I don't really go to festivals very much, but she was like, she's like, Hey, this is the first year that we're going to go to ACL. So I got us tickets before the lineup even came out. And she's like, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I was like, Phew, man, like, I don't know if I would have signed up for that, uh, you know, if we'd known the lineup. But uh, eventually we found out, you know, Paramore was going to be the main attraction. Uh, Paramore and Red Hot Chili Peppers was like the Sunday day. And then on Saturday, it was like Big Boy. I think Big Boy was like the only one I really cared about that day. But, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but it was like the type of thing where I was like, the it, we just showed up later and later as the weekend went on because we were just like, let's keep it to a minimum. Like, I don't want to stand around and watch like all of these bands that I've listened to one time. You know what I mean? Just just to be there and like just to stand in line for things. And it's like, let's get to the meat. Let's get to the people we really want to see. But who who are the people that you really wanted to see, like actually, their <clears> set <throat> for for Coachella? Man, there wasn't a lot. Uh, there was you know Blackpink. That's rare. Yeah, I feel like K-pop's kind of come in and uh, taken what um, pop did in the '90s and in the U.S. and just put it on crack, kind of. And uh, I think Blackpink's kind of like the height of that for me. So uh, it was interesting to see their production and their show. The way that it went off was amazing. Like they were definitely the most professional and uh, coolest um, act that I, I saw. I also wanted to see Gorillaz, Snail Mail. Um, I'm fascinated by how bad Young Lean is. 
Uh, so it was really fun to see him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just a, a couple other um, artists, but it, it was kind of sparse for me. I, I could give a shit about Bad Bunny. Um, yeah, I'm just not really into the boom, 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 boom type of music. Yeah. Even though I know it's like taking over everywhere, it's oh, just not yeah. my thing. And it's Frank just, Ocean isn't my thing either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like lots of people at my work and stuff are like, Bad Bunny, Bad Bunny. I'm like, dude, this is just background music. Uh, you know, like it's, this, <laughs> yeah. this is just shit you put on while you're trying to have conversations and drink beer, you know? But, you know, some people don't like to admit that. But, you know, the thing that everybody was talking about with Coachella was, you know, uh, knocked loose. Did you see their set? And do you think that it's going to have a big effect on like these big festivals and having heavier music in the future? Man, I hope so. Um, I wanted to see their set, but they put them in this like tiny tent that they limited the amount of people that could go inside. Oh, um, and so I was watching Willow Smith and then went over to knocked loose and couldn't even get in because it was just like such a small area which i thought did them pretty dirty um because they're better than most of the bands at the festival and they put them on the the worst stage and i'm sure they killed it uh, i yeah. wish i could have gotten in there but you know i've seen i've i've toured with them on warp tour and seen them a million times so i wasn't super disappointed but i do hope that it leads to putting more heavy music on some of these festivals and like i i don't see how it could do any worse than all the edm and and shit that yeah. they put everywhere no it's offense fun. to edm lovers yeah it's like you know you you get all these big festivals and you get like edm and like that boom da boom 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 da boom kind of music and it's like people will eventually end up just kind of standing around chilling and just like worrying about partying and stuff over that over over being engaging in the show but when it comes to like heavier music the fans are like there to watch the band play and that's one thing i've always loved about you know the the scene that we've played in is like people are showing up because they're interested in the music they're not just interested in like partying and having it having the show as the background yeah that's something i was like really aware of at this coachella it was um like if you go to a rock show or i mean i feel like most genre show there's songs from artists that you connect with that you just vibe with and you feel the vibration of and you want to go and feel that with a bunch of other people in an audience and connect with the artists and uh with edm it seemed like even if there were edm groups that had songs that i knew they were doing some kind of um remix rendition of those songs and it's like what i i just can't grasp what you're connecting with you know with the artists on if you're not vibing on the songs that um w made you want to go see them in the first place you know it's it seems more like you're connecting with the experience of partying and um what whatever else is encompassed other than the music at that point um and so i, I have a hard time relating to that because for me at shows i'm so um focused on the band and my connection with them uh so i'm not as worried about uh, having a million people around me right i i feel you on that one for sure and and on the on the podcast you know we we kind of talk about like current events a lot and something that seems to be reoccurring is like you know like ticket prices like with with uh festivals and like with lots of bigger artists like you know with Ticketmaster trying to fight scalping and stuff like they've come up with a system that like if it's a big band and they're like you know for instance blink 182 when they first were like coming back announcing that tom's back in the all the prices were just immediately drove up 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 and it's like and then eventually it's like 800 to a thousand bucks just for like a floor Whoa. ticket but you know like what do you like what do you think about the all of these ticket prices being so wild and you know i always bring up the fact that like lots of these bands that are doing this shit and like char overcharging or even dealing with you know ticket companies that end up overcharging like the, it's the small guy, it's the common man that really made them popular. So, like, you know, what do you, what do you really think about the fact that you have to 
to make a certain amount of money nowadays to pay for these tickets like do you, do you think it's kind of messed up for bands to not realize that they're kind of like shitting on the people that made them what they are i, th- I think for me i, I always want to try to keep the tickets reasonable um because i look back to my history as a concert goer and i like to go to a ton of shows and it seems like nowadays that kind of lifestyle would get really expensive um because ticket prices are just kind of crazy everywhere so how do you expect your fans to be able to go to shows regularly if they got to spend all their money on tickets to see you um there's a lot of things going on um even just with the pandemic and the rise of gas prices for touring and production and um the uh also expectation of having like production i I know my band we've kind of always kind of tried to keep production at a reasonable cost so that we're not having to jack up ticket prices and you have to make that decision every tour of like how much are we willing to put in if the cost of putting in a lot of money up front is to charge more money on the back end. So um, I think that's something that artists need to be more aware of is in choices you can make to um, combat that. But you you really have to do it um, consciously. Um, if, if you're not keeping track of that, nobody else is going to care because ever, you know, it's, it's about making money for, everyone involved except for the artists right <laughs> what do you uh are you a metallica fan at all um you know i like some of their older stuff um i have i respect them uh for you know their place in music yeah. and uh, you know i i think clowning on a band for maybe not being able to keep up uh a certain pace for like 30 40 years is a little unfair <laughs> um they definitely have made their mark so yeah. uh, you know I, i'm a semi fan yeah we that's another one we were kind of talking about lately too is like you know they're they they announced that their new record and their tour that they're gonna do and it's like the ticket prices are crazy for that one like and their vip were something like seven thousand dollars just to like get vip tickets for their show Holy shit. Do, <laughs> do you think that's you know like i know that they've been working their ass off their whole life but like do you think a vip ticket for seven thousand dollars is something that you should be able to like sleep at night knowing that you've charged i don't know what i could offer a vip person that i'd feel okay worth charging them that kind of money (laughs) like at a certain level like the experience just can't meet that that means for seven thousand dollars you should be able to like live at james hetfield's house for like a week (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean that was you know that's you actually said the one thing that makes it sound worth it <laughs> because I <laughs> when I when I heard that I haven't been able to think of shit that you know made it worth seven thousand dollars in that sense so it's just an Airbnb yeah. at this point <laughs> yeah for sure I mean I've seen those other ones like uh, where, where artists will do the VIP and then they won't let them be they won't let fans be more than like four feet or closer than like a few feet away from them so <laughs> yeah. like the pictures look super awkward and it's like what's the point <laughs> <laughs> the you know and another thing i brought up too is like there's a lot of you know people that are well off people that are like in their 40s and 50s that are just like kind of rich people that like pick up tickets and you know i've seen it firsthand to where they're like yeah i bought i bought tickets for the whole family but like now that where like it's tuesday that the show uh, like whatever i don't even want them like who wants these tickets as to where the the normal fan that are like spending their whole paycheck on these tickets are just like i will fucking kill somebody to see their set you know what i mean like it's, yeah. just, it's crazy to think about how we live in that right now but yeah, well, yeah. for sure i mean i'm i'm always getting locked out of uh take buying tickets you know or like you try to buy tickets to a tour as soon as it comes out and they sold out within a few minutes and you're like oh my god now i gotta go to step up and (laughs) pay an arm and a leg so yeah yeah, the whole system right now is it's a little screwy but um you know hopefully 
um, the people involved start making changes slowly to make it more affordable or bands just, you know, hit their fans up and be be like, we're going to do this one tour and gouge rich people and then we'll come back next door and it'll be cheap. So (laughs) (laughs) you got to provide like a, it's like after that rich people tour, uh, the next yeah. tour, you, you got to provide like a uh, pay stub information. <laughs> so it's like, it's like if you if you make under a certain amount, you're eligible to buy tickets for the show. Yeah, the, or or the ticket costs is depends on what bracket of earner you are. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dude, that it get real sick. complicated. I'm, dude, I, I'm I bet if that ha- if somebody did something like that, like they would fucking reach another level of popularity because like fans would really <laughs> respect that. You know, they'd be like, they'd be like, that, that was for me. I work at McDonald's <laughs> and that was for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. There, yeah, there was, there's options. We just need to get some uh, meetings with some of these people in charge. We got ideas. Yeah, that'd be sick. Uh, who was it that's, uh, was it, uh, event sevenfold that's doing their own ticket ticketing and stuff. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're going to introduce a, a thing to where they're going to sell all their own tickets to their entire tour, it sounds like. So I don't know if that's going to be something that's popular among bands, you know, bigger bands and stuff uh, moving forward. But that'll be interesting if the bands start handling all the ticket sales themselves for the venues. Yeah, they yeah I know Pearl Jam tried that um, oh, really? years ago, and it was a big disaster. Like, it was just so oh, no. hard to um, to, yeah. to manage. And so uh, hopefully, you know, I'm sure that to try something like that, they've looked at where others have failed and are, are planning something with uh, contingencies in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. So more power to them. I hope that turns out well. Yeah, they they came out with the announcement saying that like they're going to have a whole rewards program and stuff too. So like if you're buying tickets to see them, you know, like two or three times in a year, then they're going to give you like discounts on merch and like tickets and stuff like that. So it it seems like they're, you know, they're like thinking about the fan when they're doing this. Yeah. I hope it's like the hot topic punch card where you get the stamp or the punch card <laughs> every time you buy a ticket they, they're like, "All right, bring your bring your punch card." After ten, you get a free concert. <laughs> yeah, I never I, heard of that. That's a pretty. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I actually went to I went to a show the other night, and it was like when the tickets were on sale. It was the Silverstein, Dayseeker, Sea Space Cowboy, uh, one step closer. And when tickets were on sale, I was like, oh, yeah, it's only like thirty bucks. I'm definitely going. This sounds great. And then me and my wife bought a house and all the money all of our money got tied up in like that and our credit and like and I just started thinking about that all the time and I was like, now's not the best time to buy tickets. So once it all got settled up, the show was sold out. So now so then yeah. I was so then I was scrambling like, who do I know? Who do I know that could get me in? And then one of the guys who works uh, down, he works downtown Austin. He, he and he knows a bunch of you know production people. He's like, I'll get you some passes, but you're gonna have to pay, you know, at least regular ticket price. I'm like, sure, let's do it. But one of my buddies came out to the. He drove down there, and because he thought I would be able to get him a th- a third ticket, and he drove down there, and he's like. Uh, eventually, I, sh- I told him like, man, I'm not gonna be able to get it. We only got these two, and he's like, all right, I'm getting on StubHub. I'm going to come to the show anyways because I already drove down here. So he said he still ended up paying 140 for like third party tickets. Wow. And yeah. yeah. So even whenever it's a super small personal like show where tickets originally are 30 bucks, you could get that $140 hookup. So it's like wow. so yeah. He's made a lot of money uh, you know, investing in crypto and stocks and stuff lately so he he's doing good <laughs> okay so i shouldn't feel too bad for the guy but... <laughs> he should pay right. those uh, high ticket prices that's all you're saying i know that dance gavin dance just got back from europe um how has everything been going for y'all pretty good i mean we just did kind of back-to-back um europe runs or uk runs and then a europe run uh, we played a festival in February, so this year's been off to a pretty active start. Um, 
Uh, we'll probably try to do uh, some U.S. stuff um, later this year, too. And we're working on that. And um, just starting to think about writing a new record, which will be a whole process. But um, that's part of why I've been trying to hit up as many shows and festivals as possible, too, to get um, inspiration. And uh, I, I feel like I take inspiration from good bands to where I'm like, oh, man, that's awesome. I want to do something like that. Or if I see a band that I don't like, I'm also inspired and I'm like, man, fuck that. I know I could do way better than that. So (laughs) either way it's inspirational. Um, So I just like to take in as much live entertainment as possible before starting the writing process. You know, it seems like whether, you know, y'all are putting out one every year or it's taking more than a year. It's like, you're still popping them out faster than a lot of bands. And I, and I, you know, I've been a fan since before we met and before we toured together, but like even back in the day, it was like one album every year for so many years, right? Like the the first four or something like that. Yeah. We were popping them out like every year and a half. Um, We, uh, the pace of the, of everything since the pandemic has definitely slowed a little bit. Um, you know, just supply night, supply chain issues, um, vinyl uh, press, print, vinyl printing backups. Um, there are just so many things that uh, have been introduced to making it a little tougher to put out records quickly. Um, so that's, you know, been something that we've had to work on overcoming and rise has been really good about um trying to troubleshoot all that stuff with us and we still want to get records out as quickly as possible um not just to push them out but because that's just how we work we like to keep the writing muscles um worked out and uh to keep putting out new stuff that we're proud of to the fans and you know we work hard to do that and have our whole career and we'll continue to I've always been really proud of y'all for what you've done because there, there's been times as a fan to where it's like you have another one coming out. I'm like, oh, sick. I'm going to check it out. Another one coming out. There's another one coming out. And then I was like, I've gotten to a point where like in my mind <laughs> with people always suggesting this, suggesting that. And then, you know, y'all coming out with new music, I, was, I had in my mind like, well, you know, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to sleep on this one and I'll just get around to it whenever I can. But then whenever I eventually did listen to the newest one, I was like, shit, they did it again. Like, this one's sick (laughs) as fuck. And so, like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm like, nah, let's just chill out. Let's just wait a little bit. You know, I I need to give it a break before I try out their new record. And then when I finally do, I'm like, damn, dude, why did I sleep on this shit? (laughs) You know what I mean? So so I've always been really happy with what y'all have always put out. Oh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I kind of take music in similarly, too. Um, if there's something that everybody's talking about, mm. uh, I'll, I'll kind of avoid it because I don't want the hype and buzz to affect how I process the record. Mm-hmm. And then later I'll give it a chance. And once it's kind of died down and be like, oh, shit, I, I totally you know understand what everyone's going crazy about the only thing that sucks is that then i'm hyped on a record and everyone else is like oh that was so like a year ago you know they're on to something different yeah. so, whatever yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I same same with me like everything music games movies whatever like i've had i've had games before where i'm like i cannot wait to pick it up i pick it up and then my roommates would play it all the fucking time and i would be like yeah, I'm not playing this shit. <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wait till next year to play this shit. So, yeah, I just did that with Cyberpunk. Thank God I waited. Nice. I didn't it yeah. suck at first. Like they fixed a lot of oh. stuff with that. Yeah, it was a shit show at first, but by the time I got to it, it was a great game. <laughs> nice. That's dope. It's the best way to play it after they fix all the bugs and got all the the updates out of the way that everyone was complaining <laughs> about. It's almost kind of what you have to do with a lot of stuff now. Uh, the same happened with that game uh, where you're in space. I can't remember what it's called, but no man's land no no man's sky. Oh, no man's sky. Yeah, oh, yeah, I heard it was trash at the beginning, and now it's a it's a really rad game. But you know, and a year later, it it took 
to for the hype and you know the hype died out in that year long wait to make a, make the game good. So that sucks. Yeah, yeah, I stopped pre ordering games a while ago just because it seems like now when a game comes out, it's the beginning of the beta test. Yes. And then after like six months to a year, everything's patched and working. And then it's like, all right, now the game is ready to play. So yeah, video games. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty big gamer, so I'm, I'm constantly playing games. But I try to give games a little bit of time to, to work the kinks out because it seems like most of the game developers kind of put them out unfinished now. Well, yeah, I think. We we just had that big story with the uh, multiverses that DC uh, fighting game, uh, where they they've had it out for almost a year or something, and they just they're about they they're either about to pull it or they already pulled it, but they're about to pull it from all the mm-hmm. uh, all the things, and they said it was a beta, and that it's always been a beta version, and that so they're gonna pull it and work on oh, it. For, pu- they're gonna work on it for a year and then re-release it again, and and people that have already spent their money. Too bad, sucker. You spent that money. It's gone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> Real slimy stuff. Yeah. I played that game and it was a shitty uh, rip off of uh, Super Smash anyway. So. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I think that we have. I'd a rather real... play Brawl Hollow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I think the problem is, like, nowadays, too, is like money fuels so many things that, like, we don't give the artists, their time to make these things. You know what I mean? There's always a deadline. There's always, like, pressure. And it's never done. You know what I mean? With, like, a, with like games and stuff like that. Even, we've even yeah. seen, we've even seen shows and movies and stuff that, like, are coming out, and then they're, like, touching up some of the CGI and stuff before it's even left the theater. You know what I mean? And so... I don't know. I just don't understand why, like, Warner Brothers is usually involved in that. But it's like, why don't we just let everyone work on the stuff and let them finish the stuff and be proud of the stuff? And then we could put it out, you know? So, yeah, they just try to rush everything out. I mean, I I don't know how we're going to compete with AI once (laughs) that gets up and running, you know, because like there's mid journey right now for art and, you know, Dolly, a couple, all these AI um, art generators that um, you just put in a prompt, you know, and then it creates the art that you want. And like, imagine if they had that for music, you know, like mid journey, but mid song or something. And then you're just like, all right, I want to hear a record by, these artists or these instruments, you know, people on these instruments with this vocalist and this style make a record and then it instantly makes a record. Um, or same thing with a movie, you're like, I want a Quentin Tarantino movie in space with Samuel Jackson. <laughs> yeah. And then, hey, I don't you, hate this idea though. <laughs> yeah. And then you share it with your friends after tweaking it a little bit, like, oh, check out this movie I made with Mid Journey, Quentin Tarantino style. So, like, yeah. I mean, after well, that, just like I don't know how artists are gonna compete. Well, they've already had a, a thing uh, in Hollywood where they are saying that like people will be allowed, like writers will be allowed to use like you know like the AI Chat GPT like that are, and stuff like that to like help them write because they they claim now that it's all circumstantial. So it's like it's all about what the the artist, the writer is putting into it to, to ask it what it wants. So it's like, so, so they're saying it's like, it's cool because if you weren't the writer asking it for certain things, then you wouldn't get this outcome. You know what I mean? So, so they're saying it's all. Yeah. Yeah. So so like, I wonder what's going to happen. Like if you do that on like an AI creator, then would it be like they'd have DLC of like, oh, well, if you want Tom Cruise to be in your movie, you got to pay five bucks for the <laughs> Tom Cruise avatar, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I think we'll get into um, we'll get into issues with uh, people suing because of their likenesses and stuff. Like, I didn't give you permission to use my likeness and or my voice or you know whatever so we'll we'll probably have like a, a future of really weird lawsuits and copyright of someone's being you know <laughs> something like that yeah. yeah for sure like or how do you um 
trademark like a style, you know, somebody's like, I want something in the style of this person. Um, does that person get paid because their style's being used, or is that something that can even be verified or you know, like yeah, given a set of this is what it is? Like if somebody's like, I want a swan core style album, you know, do I get money? <laughs> like, <laughs> I think you're already owed a lot of money at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just wild to think about where we're going because you know some of us have some of us are already fucking shaking our heads. <laughs> we're like looking around at movies and and games and stuff, and we're like, what what is happening, man? Just just let just let someone go to town on some cool shit and let them finish, you know and. Yeah. Now we now we have AI to fucking jump in and fucking probably ruin everyone's day. Honestly, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I, I I'm uncertain of where that singularity thing is gonna land. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what what have you been into lately, nerd wise? Like movies, games, uh. What, what um, shows? Anything? TV what? shows. I, I've been really into Yellow Jackets. Um, that okay. show is awesome. Um, any oh. movies I've seen? I, I dig the newer Scream movie. Uh, I didn't watch the newest one yet because I um, was going to go see that. or I, I was waiting to watch that with my girlfriend, so I wasn't going to see it before her. Right. But the last one, I liked the, the guy from The Boys was in it. Um I really liked that show as well. Oh, yeah. um, if you liked that one, uh, the new one is really good too. It's like yeah. the continuation of that one. Like we have the three that all really tie together. Then we have the, yeah. new, two, the new two that are like really tying together. There's what? Five. That is, yeah. Right, right. There's yeah, five yeah, yeah. together. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I watched the new one uh, and it was really it was really good, honestly. To, especially yeah. with, with the last one as the tie together, you know? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm stoked for it. I'm always a horror buff. Um, so I, I can't wait to see the new Ari Aster movie, even though I heard it's more like thriller than horror. Yeah. But still, he's one of the more interesting directors right now. Bo is a movie, um, right? That one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I and um, our, I know our poster is up on the wall in somebody's room in that, oh, that's in cool. that movie. Hell yeah. So I was that's stoked awesome. about that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been tough musically lately to find a lot of stuff that I'm into. Um, I, I was listening to Baby Kim a lot, and I was like, "All right, man, I need to get into some more stuff that's gonna be able to inspire me to create the music that I make." And uh, there hasn't been a lot, so I've just been trying to go to shows. Um, like I saw Sunny Day Real Estate like maybe a week ago, um, and that was awesome. And uh, yeah, just any older bands that are touring that I, I dig like that and and take that in and try to um, see where I feel like I could take that. Um, an another question I was kind of thinking of too is like, you know, like with the whole with the career of Dance Gavin Dance, you've went through like singer changes a lot but you know lately it's been there's been a lot of sh you know stuff going on it's like we had the passing of tim you know and i'm sure that affected y'all a lot he's a fucking great guy and yeah, we, also yeah. Had, we had a lot of stuff w with tillian and you had to adjust to where um what's what's y'all's guitar andrew right andrew yeah uh, Andrew went to vocals at a point in that one tour, and then you had um, Mark filled in on guitar, and then yeah, what's the what's the bass player uh, or who played bass on that tour? Uh, Sergio Medina. Sergio, Sergio, yeah. yeah. And you know, with all that going on, like almost around the same time, like was it tough for y'all to adjust to that, and and how did you? probably come out stronger in the end with that yeah i mean it was it was definitely tough uh i know it was like kind of a bad mental health year for me of just yeah. like getting myself in a place that i felt 
good um which was already hard with the pandemic like mm-hmm. um just being somebody who's always on the road and playing music and not having that as an option uh, or not knowing when that was going to come back really affected me um and thinking of like what i what my life is <laughs> you know if, if that yeah. were to stop because it's what i've done since i was a teenager um, and then coming back from that, there's been a lot of hardships and, um, I, you know, I've just been trying to navigate it the best that I can and, uh, and pour, you know, kind of all my feelings into, um, the music, um, you know, I've been doing some writing and stuff on my own before, um, we start writing and, uh, the songs that I've been writing by myself are, are very personal and, um, I think the process of of writing those songs has helped me immensely in getting through all of uh, all of what the last couple of years have kind of thrown at us. Right, I feel you. I uh, I've had you know I've I've been there, you know I've been in the same spot. I've had a friend commit suicide like over Christmas break while I was staying at his house at, at a point in oh time. Oh my God, so, sorry to hear that. Yeah, it, I I happened to, you know, we were out partying the night it happened, but I just so happened to stay somewhere else that night. And one of my one of my best friends lived with him. So it was like, we uh, it was like the type of thing where I'm like, hey, when are y'all going to come get me? Hey, when are we going to start drinking? And then he's like, so the cops are here. This is what happened. And so like, you know, for that to happen over Christmas break, you know, while that was while I was touring and stuff, but it was, you know, it affects you, you know, like you you never really get over, you know, whenever you, one of your friends passes away, but you always have to find something that'll make you feel better about the situation. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy that y'all kept going and, you know, you found a way to deal with all of that. Tim was a great dude. I, I love partying with that guy. Um, also, how did you, how was it with Mark? You know, you know, I, I know that you've probably known Mark for a long time, but like, how did, how was the process of like getting him to come fill in on guitar and, and just shred it up? Um, he, uh, pretty easy. I mean, he's been a friend of the bands for a long time. Um, we really like and respect um, Vale and, uh yeah when we needed a guitar player he was like the first guy we asked and um i mean he's actually right here he's my roommate (laughs) (laughs) oh Oh, nice so you can't say anything bad about him right now (laughs) (laughs) that's probably the best guy i know (laughs) well well i i you know i've known mark for a long time and i and i've you know on the dl i've always really wanted him to be on the show so if you could uh you know put in a good word with him because <laughs> because <laughs> yeah mark Rick wants you to be on his show because <laughs> i know that like we've never we've never been like super tight i've always been tighter with danny like he was like the tightest i was with in in that band um, yeah. but but i remember one time i got mark's number and i was like oh man yeah. like let, let me let me shoot a text at him, and what up? him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but yeah i remember shooting a text and i was like i don't think i ever heard back and i was like oh shit man man does he not like me or maybe this is the wrong number maybe he got a new number i've always just i've always just i think it's because you didn't text do you like me yes or no <laughs> <laughs> No, man, he says he's down. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Well, I'm coming to his show uh, in May here in Austin. So, uh, well, oh, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll talk to him about that. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I, I, I came to, out to y'all's show when he was playing guitar, and it, and it felt like it was a natural fit. So, and you know, Andrew killed it on vocals too. So, you know, uh, despite. Tillian being out on that one, I, I had a great time at the show, and I, and I wouldn't even bat an eye if it was like the first time I ever saw y'all. So, I oh applaud, yeah, I appreciate it, but yeah, I applaud y'all for handling that shit very well. So, but yeah, it's it's been a crazy 
couple years, I gotta say. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is the first year in maybe three years that started off in the first few months where I'm like, oh wait, this might not be a shitty year. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm yeah. keeping my fingers crossed because uh, things are off to a good start so far. I mean, I I I start to think about that. Uh, you know, like I I know that I I got married almost two years ago now. I moved to Austin in 2020, and for a while, bef- you know, not not even talking about my marriage, but like just like moving to a new place, starting over. There were a lot of dark times where I was like, "Man, what the fuck am I doing for real?" So I feel you on like whenever a new year comes around, you're like, "Is this gonna be a good one?" Or am I gonna shit the bed this year? So, yeah. but but lately it's been picking up. I like it. Uh, it's I've been having a good time. So I always, you know, I'm always like I think people overlook the fact that like no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, you're in a band, you're a famous actor, you're whatever, dude. Things can get dark no matter what. So money is not always gonna make you happy. Playing in a band isn't always gonna make you happy. So. It just depends on how everybody handles it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel super lucky to be a musician and uh, have the career that I've had. Um, And there are definitely huge concessions in your life you have to make to be a constantly touring musician, like the ability to feel like home, you know, at home and maintaining relationships with friends and uh, significant others while you're on the road and uh, just there's a lot of things you got to give up and uh, to be able to do what you're passionate about playing music and share that with people and uh, be able to impact people on that level to where they're connecting with you and your pain or whatever it is that you're um, kind of outletting in through your music um, is you know it's kind of a magical feeling so it's you get a lot but you know there are there's always the grass is greener of like I wonder what it'd be like to um, be somewhere for a long time and see how that feels you know um, yeah and, but not in the context of the pandemic where it's like all right well I can't leave my house <laughs> well it's you know like with the grass is greener situation I bet there was like twenty percent of people that love the shit out of the pandemic they were like. I've been waiting to stay home <laughs> and be by myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they were they were the ones that were like, shit, dude. Like, I've been trying to stay home for the past three years, but I've been having to go to work. Now I get to stay home and touch myself and play with my dogs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk well, about I'm happy one. for those small percentage of people that were super <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they've they've never came out of that shit too. You could tell, like the people that like since the pandemic, you're like, you're like, hey man, uh, we, we're getting together for this or that. Nah, man, I'm just gonna stay home. <laughs> like you know, oh, it's it's your birthday, come out. Like nah, I'll just gonna stay home. It's my birthday. I'll do whatever. Are you whatever taking I a jab want. at me? Are you taking a jab at me right now? <laughs> no, no, not specifically, but you need to get out more. Too. <laughs> But hey, not everyone. Not everyone likes their birthdays. Though. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, when I, I was actually... young, I used to I used to be pretty emo about it. Like, oh, I don't want anything for my birthday. I don't want to be celebrated. It'll just let me do my own thing. You know, let me just sit and listen to my Thursday records. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I know. I know a girl that cries every year on her birthday, and. It's just like, dude, come on. You can't cry every fucking year. Like, she started crying every year on her birthday when she turned, like, 26. And I'm like, there's no reason to fucking cry whenever you're a pretty white girl and you're turning 26. <laughs> like, like this is just... Rick, there's a, song, there's a song that even says, it's my birthday, I'll cry if I want to. Shut up. Yeah, I'm just. That's it. I respect the tradition of it. Yeah. <laughs> she keeps it going. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's. Uh, I I actually was interested to hear what you have to say because there was a point in time where every time we would see each other, we would uh we'd start talking about some Marvel movies and you know what's going on with that. And I know that in fan world, it's been kind of disappointing lately. But I, I wanted to hear your take on uh, everything that's been going on, like 
after Endgame in the MCU because I know we were super stoked for a while. And I remember you telling me that Endgame really wasn't your favorite because it went like full comic book. And you were saying that like, you were like, I'm into it, but it's just like that full, full comic book kind of like, you know, made you disappointed. But what, ha how have you felt about the MCU ever since then? I feel like uh, even though Endgame wasn't my favorite, it still had a direction that um, took into account everything that was going on before it, the whole buildup, and tried to put it together in a satisfying way with a villain that had been built up over years, um, you know, of end credit sequences and, you know, rumors and things like that throughout the movies. Right. So I just felt like there was a, a direction and they really had the core cast well um, built and seemed to know what they were doing. And they completed the MCU all the way up to Endgame. And then post Endgame, it doesn't seem like they really have had any um, direction. Like, I would think that after Endgame, they would have started to have like, introduced this Kang guy immediately, you yeah. know, like get a new thread out there, even if it's just in end credit sequences. But I feel like the rollout for him has been so slow right. and all the movies yes. in the meantime, they've just been like inconsequential to the overall storyline as far as I'm concerned. So it's just like get to the, you built this whole connected universe and that the connectivity between the films and characters has been one of the big selling points and things that people are so excited and, um, and impressed by. And they kind of abandoned that all. Um, and maybe they're going to start trying to bring that back with like forming a new Avengers and doing this Kang thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So far, it's been kind of aimless since Endgame, in my opinion. And there's been some bright spots and a lot of mediocrity. Um, and nothing really that's come close to any of the greats before, like Infinity War or um, Civil War. Like, those movies are awesome. Right. And I haven't seen anything since that has gotten me that excited. What's been your but uh, favorite out of the the new wave of Marvel movies and least favorite, or even shows, because they started introducing all the the Moon Knights, the She Hulks, and stuff like that. Yeah. What's been your favorite and least favorite out of everything so far? The shows I kind of gave up on. I watched WandaVision. I thought it was a really interesting idea, um, but just didn't really come together for me. Especially at the end, uh, it just kind of seemed like it all kind of fell apart. And then after that, just each show just felt more and more low budget and like filler, you know, it's like yeah. each show might have felt like a rushed. point where it's like, oh, this is why the show exists. But then all the rest of the episodes are like, uh, I don't really care. So I, I kind of gave up on those, uh, which sucks because now apparently if you don't watch those, you're not going to quite know what's happening in the <laughs> movies. And so it's just, yeah, I think they built too quick and, uh, kind of I, i'm sure that a lot of it had to do with just trying to boost their disney plus service and they've kind of cannibalized star wars and marvel at the um you know as a cost to trying to get more subscribers and now both of the brands are in worse places than they were um and i don't think disney plus is even that much better for it so yeah, I don't know. I think Disney's just making a lot of mistakes, and I hope that they write the ship, or at least DC comes in and learns from their mistakes and does something better. So one of the things uh, I could say about that is, like, so right after the, I would say, Endgame, right after Endgame, the guy, what is, I can't really, I can't remember his name, but the guy who was, like, pretty much one of the head guys at Disney who was in charge of, he was pretty much in charge of saying yes and no to projects and uh, stuff like that. Bob Iger? Yeah, Bob Iger. He, he left the company. And so yeah. uh, a new guy came in. Was it? Bob JPEG. Yeah, Bob JPEG. And recently, just now within the last couple of months, 
Bob Iger came back, right, to to take his original position back. And one of the things that came out uh, that he that he said was whenever Bob JPEG was in there was he wanted to focus on quantity not quality right not in those words but it was apparent with how many shows were coming out how many movies were coming out and now that uh bob Iger's back he's like no we're slowing it down we're gonna focus on quality again we had too many things coming out all at once and i and he said i feel like that's why there's a decline on like the popularity of some of the movies and the shows and stuff like that and then, I did and, hear that. Yeah. yeah, I keep track of um, Disney and a lot of yeah. the other companies doing this stuff, and that was like kind of exciting until they just announced all the new slate of Star Wars movies, <laughs> and See, then I was like, different. "Really, another Ray movie?" Okay, so another thing that I could say about that. Okay, so Kathleen Kennedy is uh you know he she's like the kevin feige of the star wars universe right but when it comes to that side of things uh it seems like she is in the wrong when it comes to a lot of projects because okay so if you look at kevin feige and what he's done since the pandemic sure the decline you know there's been a decline in popularity but if you look at all the numbers they've made like six billion dollars off of all of these marvel projects since the pandemic but if you look at star wars and its theater release schedule since the pandemic it is like next to nothing happening right so so those are the differences in the two it's like we could all, we could all, well, not me personally, because I mean, I've really still enjoyed a lot of Marvel stuff, but like as fans, everyone's like, you know, f- uh, fuck Marvel and fuck Star Wars. It's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Marvel is at least still trying. They still have a, uh, a lot of things coming out. They're still making good money for the company. But if you look at Star Wars, they have a lot of shows that are coming out. Like Mandalorian is about the only thing that's been like top notch. And people have been complaining about that falling off with this new season. But when it comes to what's in the theater, there's like absolutely nothing to even go see. And then we also have Kevin Feige wanted to make a Star Wars movie. And then Kathleen Kennedy was like, no, that's not happening. And then, (laughs) you know, and then we have Kathleen Kennedy being like, we're bringing back (laughs) Ray. So it's like, do we not learn? from our <laughs> from our mistakes you know what i mean at least marvel's trying yeah. to learn from their mistakes so yeah what, what's, uh, what's i, I your, would agree what's been your favorite stuff from from uh star the star wars side of things you know i thought mandalorians season one and two were great um, they were I, you, they had a story to tell that john favreau obviously thought out to get um, the Mandalorian with Grogu and then end up having Grogu go with Luke and mm-hmm. kind of in the same time as doing that retconning um, the whole Luke thing from Last Jedi mm-hmm. or uh, not Last Jedi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Last Jedi. Um, right. Uh, and making him not a loser, you know? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I, I thought that that story was well told. And then afterwards it's all, pretty obvious that they've kind of brought Grogu back just because he's the only thing that uh, Star Wars fans really care about at this point. And this newest season of Mandalorian is kind of aimless, you know, because the story they had to tell with him is told. And it's just like a cash grab now. So I feel like people are starting to kind of realize that while watching it and it's a little saddening to see something that was so solid kind of go to shit pretty quickly. Um, Other than that, you know, I checked out a little bit of Andor and it was really good. Um, A little slow and I will finish it, but I thought it was, it was definitely one of the best things that they've done. Um, Other than that, like the Clone Wars and those cartoon shows were never really my thing. Uh, they were always told in just too conveniently childish of yeah. storylines and like just not really intelligently done, in my opinion. Like for kids, I think they're great. 
but right. for me, I just couldn't really dive into them. So I, I, um, I'm not a huge fan of those. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, Star Wars is in a pretty bad place for me. I wasn't. I was one of the people who was excited about um, them continuing the original trilogy of characters that you're interested in. And I was open minded to Ray and Finn, and I thought Finn was an amazing setup for a character that yeah. was just completely gone nowhere with. Um, and if they had done like a Finn centric movie, who knows? It could have been really cool. Um, it still could be if they yeah. uh, canceled his Ray movie and do a Finn becoming a Jedi <laughs> movie. You know, that could well, still be sick. I just feel like if they would have had a plan. For all three of the new trilogy, it would have ended up in a better spot than we got it. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, it's just you can't like if if I was gonna write a book series that everyone already loves, why would I write three chapters and hand them off to three different people? You know what I mean? Like, and then whatever yeah. and whenever part two failed just give it back to the first person. You know what I mean? Like that just sounds like bad business already. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, and it's even worse when you find out later that there was, uh, you know, kind of a idea for all three movies that JJ had when he did force awakens. And then Kathleen Kennedy was just like, or Ryan Johnson was just like, I don't really want to do that. And Kathleen was like, sure, do whatever, um, <laughs> which was a horrible yeah. decision. And then there was just no coming back from that. I'm sure Snoke probably wasn't supposed to die. And so, like, what are you supposed to do after your main character or your main antagonist you've been building up just gets kind of unceremoniously quickly (laughs) killed? Like, uh, there was just almost no way to save it. So the third movie, I I almost can't even judge because it was an impossible task after the second one to write that ship. It was just like, all right, they yeah. sunk it with last Jedi for me. I'm one of the people who hates that movie. Obviously. <laughs> I, I fell off the star Wars train a long time ago. So I feel like, I feel like when it comes to me, like I could still enjoy a lot of the stuff that comes out because I'm just like, yeah, I don't really care about star Wars that much. You know what I mean? Like I'm focused yeah. on comics, like Marvel comics and, and the story with Marvel and like the MCU I'm into, even whenever the MCU has done like stuff that I'm not super into, I'm still like better than star Wars, you know, better than, (laughs) you know, better than DC at this point. But but, like even the new season of Mandalorian, I was like, I was very uninterested in. And whenever I started watching it, I was like, Hey, this is pretty good. And and then I hear fans hating on it. And I'm like, Oh, I guess for someone who just (laughs) thought it was gonna tank anyways it was better than i thought it was gonna be but at the same time i guess i could see you know why everybody's hating on it because it seems like din is getting pushed out you know what i mean so (laughs) yeah yeah i don't have any problem with anybody who likes any of that stuff either yeah uh, yeah. i i it you know it, it definitely does hold different importance for for different people and um you know like I was raised on the original trilogy um, and it was, you know, part of my childhood. And then when the um, prequels came out, I remember going to see them when I was really young and just the fanfare around it, people being all dressed up at the theater and, you know, young me was just like super stoked on, yeah, on them. And, uh, as I grew up and saw the flaws in the filmmaking, they're still <laughs> so interesting. Like I yeah. can watch the prequels and laugh at what's bad and enjoy what's good. Right. Um, be, uh, part of that, I think, too, is just because you know that they were an uh, honest um, attempt at world building, and I can respect that because, like George Lucas cared to continually build the world of star Wars with every film rather than just cashing in on what he had already created. 
um, yeah. and wanting to come up with new ideas and whether they failed, like the idea that many chlorines can your blood control the <laughs> amount of force you had or, right. or succeeded like having a cool pod race. Um, I, you know, you could tell that it was coming from a sincere place and in the, um, uh, remake or, I mean, force awakens basically is a remake, but in the, um, sequel trilogy, I just don't ever really get that feeling, um, especially Last Jedi. It almost feels like that movie is made to troll people who cherish the uh, originals and uh, made you know really dislike them. Yeah, we. Uh, that's what I've always said too. Is like people that hate on the the prequels. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, seems pretty sick to me. Like, I. I get that there's some wacky stuff that happens and some of the dialogue isn't the greatest, but as far as the story being told, it's like, I never would have guessed that that's where the prequels would come from story-wise. You know what I mean? Like after the originals, I didn't think we were going to get, get like Palpatine was like a part of the, you know, the system like the government or whatever and tricked everyone into like voting for him, you know, <laughs> stuff like <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I, I was just like, this is wild to think about. This was where this came from. But whenever you get to the sequel trilogy, you're like, so what's this one about? Cause I don't really know. <laughs> like, I don't know what they're trying to say at all through the whole thing. So, yeah, I don't know. Either. And, yeah. I'm not sure if there is a message really um <laughs> yeah because there's not really much for character arc in the sequel trilogy like i don't think ray really has any overcoming thing where she isn't already um like su- capable of uh, overcoming them from the beginning um finn goes nowhere poe like starts out as like this han solo-ish character and then in the second and third movies just kind of there because he was already there so they're like all right, well, right. He's, he's in the group crew you know i think um, that i think originally they were trying to tell us that like it doesn't matter who you are you can be a jedi it doesn't matter if you were a stormtrooper you could turn into a good guy and go far and then it just started get, getting lost as we got to the end and it was just like yeah. it's not about that at all it's just about another person being part of a lineage you know what i mean so it's like very counterintuitive yeah. from front to back so. yeah the, it makes messages within their own trilogy and yeah. it, that just shouldn't be you know, like, <laughs> exactly. it makes no sense <laughs> i do have one question about uh dance gavin dance how the hell do you pick your set list from such a big back catalog? <laughs> Dude, it's so hard. Is it miserable? Is it? It's got to be so miserable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have group texts about it. We'll use analytics from Spotify. Yeah, and we'll pull kids on Twitter and like get all this information, bring it together, and be like, "How do we make a set that people aren't going to be all pissed off about you?" <laughs> Because even if you if you pull one song from each album, like that's what is that ten albums? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's and we usually can only do at the most like fourteen songs right. as a band of our style. Yeah. You know, like um, I, I remember I'm a huge Blood Brothers fan. Oh, me too. They, yeah. When they would headline back in the day, they'd play like forty minutes, and uh, they tried to make some songs on their later records to make it so they could play longer and um that i you know I, they were successful at it because i pretty much love everything they've done but me too i just i don't know how to go about the, turning the dial down you know and i don't think that the other guys in our band do either so we just write at hard mode and then figure it out later it's but it's almost, sets impossible. It's almost a a good problem that because I'm sure you've got fans like oh I wish you guys would have played this song or that song because I mean that's a good problem right like ah uh, maybe next time but there's such a big back catalog of just f- fucking bangers that it's it's hard to it's hard to play them all it's hard to play you know 
Uh, uh, do you do it? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could do it like with with generations of of the band, like with vocalists, and you know, do it in eras. I guess I should say is uh, one or two songs off this era, one or two songs off this era, and then that's kind of what we try to do and keep it spread out. Like we'll be like, oh wait, that's too many songs off that one record. <laughs> get more records than that. It is. It's so freaking hard. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, we uh, we do take analytics and stuff in, like, and we get real scientific about it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that as as yeah. a fan that you you really look at like, okay, people are are listening to this song and this song the most, and that that's pretty cool. Yeah, I love uh, everything that y'all do, but there's a real special place in my heart uh with the death star album and the happiness record so happiness is one, okay. of, my, one of my all-time yeah. favorites so so especially oh, yeah. like on the last tour i seen y'all on whenever kurt did some songs and you did all the screaming i was just like this is this is what i'm here for this is specifically for me <laughs> we'll have to do like a happiness tour at some point <laughs> oh my god i would love mm. that that'd be so cool i would love that but yeah, we'll try to uh, make that happen. Um, I forgot to do the sponsor, so I'll do it real quack, real quack, real quack, <laughs> quack, quack, quack. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a swan, not a duck. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, y'all. If you've enjoyed uh, nerding out, you and you need some new headphones, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the wrong picture. <laughs> it's got the wrong. It's fine. It's fine. Go. <laughs> go to the link. Go to the link in the description. Go look up some new Sennheiser headphones. There's going to be like six to eight options on there. Uh, and if you use the discount code one zero nerding out, you will get a ten percent discount. And thank you for watching nerding out. So, but will uh, if you want to give plugs for all your stuff, I'm sure everybody knows. But go ahead, and if you want to say anything, we'll get you in there before we take off. Yeah, keep an eye out. We'll be doing some touring uh, this year with DGD, so hopefully we can uh, figure that out soon. And um, also, my other band, Royal Coda, should be doing some shows this year. That's uh, the one with Kurt and me. And um, you know, keep an eye out for that. And Blue Swan Records, my label, um, we're working on some releases that are going to be really cool. So uh, you know, check out our. Um, our website and YouTube for all that stuff. And thanks for the support. And uh, hopefully I'll see all y'all soon. Uh, Listen, if you want to go see some of the stuff I do, I do uh, the Secret Levels podcast, which is a retro video game review show where you can uh, hear us go over one game per episode. We go over the history, the story, the gameplay, some fun facts. And uh, it's a good old time. We let you know if these old games are still worth playing. And uh, yeah, you can uh, check it out at all the major podcasting platforms, Secret Levels Podcasts. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Toby Von Doom if you want. I don't know. Maybe maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Uh, also, you know, thanks for watching Nerding Out. You can check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, the YouTube is like the main thing we got going on. We're on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, we need more follows on there. I'm going to start streaming some games soon on Twitch. Uh, and if you want to go to my personal Instagram, it's I hate ghosts with an S at the end. Also working on phantom figures, music that's coming soon, but yeah, thanks for, uh, checking it out. And if you have any comments or questions, hit us up at nerding out with rickshaw at gmail.com. And we will see y'all later. See you later nerds. <laughs>